Yeah. All right, well, we might as well get started. So, very pleased to introduce Ben Kovitz. He's from Cognitive Science and Computer Science. And I think you're trying to finish this year. That's the goal. So, <laughs> you're one of our last wonks, uh, talks for this calendar year. So, take it away. All right, so the talk is, are FARC models a super implementation of AMP? Does anyone have any clue what I'm talking about? Good. I know originally this was going to be a 10 minute lightning talk. I learned yesterday it's going to be a 45 minute, or no, only 35 minute uh, um, uh, talk. It's going to be a long lightning talk. Um, so, three parts. I'm going to explain what AM is. You can probably guess, I'm going to explain what FARG models are. And then, <coughs> all right. and then, um, then I'm really much more interested in what you folks have to think because I'm not really a PL person, but I've had in the back of my mind. This is, there's a there's some PL idea here waiting to get out, and I've I've tried several times to get it out and I've failed. Um, let's see. Here goes. Does one implement the other? Okay, so um, so nobody here has heard of M. Is that right? Okay. Um, so AMB is a, a, one of the original LISP functions. It was, a, a lot of, very, it was invented very early in the history of LISP by um, John McCarthy. And it's a function that takes two arguments and it returns you know, maybe one, maybe the other. You don't know. Right? It's ambiguous. Right? So you don't know what, you don't know what it is. When I first heard of this, I thought, oh man, this is what gives, but this is what this is what makes the word academic pejorative. You know, <laughs> it's like, why does anybody need a function like this? You know, it's like, isn't it bad enough to have determinate? You know, <laughs> are we just like, what are we doing? Right on the spot. However, M actually is really uh, useful and actually just very fundamental, but people don't really, don't think of it too much. So um, M gets to become. Um, useful when you combine it with another function called require, and require takes a condition. Um, oops. It doesn't return anything. It just has a side effect, which is if this condition evaluates to false, the program crashes. Right? <laughs> so we're saying we, we want this to be true, right? This has to be true. So, um, if you if you require something that involves a, a value that in, that has an amp in it, then that's going to narrow down what that amp could evaluate to. Because in other words, the amp is going to try to satisfy the require. So, but how many people have ever tried to write a SAT solver? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So I'm going to show you how to write a SAT solver in three lines. All right. It's depending on how you count the lines. Of course, that's how it is. <laughs> um, so um, let's see. Let's see. Let here. I've I've been relearned a little scheme syntax to do this right. <laughs> um, I've been doing closure for most of the time. All right. So let's see. so A is maybe it's true, maybe it's false. All right. B maybe it's true, maybe it's false. All right, I'm going to say require. All right, you see where I'm going? <laughs> All right, we can just, now you can just do whatever you want. You can say, you know, something like, just a random example. Of All right. All right, and this um, this expression. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> Evaluate that. There you go. It's going to print out your. It's going to print out values for A, B, and C that satisfy the require. So that it, see, three lines. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you if you evaluate this, um, you'll get. I mean, you probably actually. It's really easy to solve this. Um, how, how, would any, how would someone here find uh, 
just kind of staring at this, how would you think of A, B, and C? And I have a, I have a peculiar reason for asking this, which I can do because it's not a lightning talk. Before that, I'm a bit unclear. It's, they are literally like flipping a coin to decide between the, the first or second argument, or does it have like global knowledge of the program and other like requires and, and tries to pick the one that, that satisfies the conditions in the require? It's totally undefined. Right. <laughs> well, I guess what I'm clear on is like, if you run this program, is there a chance that like it might succeed sometimes and fail others, or do most of the foundations of Lisp uh, attempt to make it so that program would succeed if possible? Well, a reasonable implementation of M will, you know, try to make it succeed. Okay. And um, it, it, but the the core idea of M actually is to represent in Lisp the notion of uh, non-determinism. Right. Yeah. That C and B. So it's the same idea. In non-determinism, one way to think of non-determinism in computers, which its name, of course, is that when when you have to make a choice, uh, you always make the right choice. You know, so, so that's one way to think of it. Yeah. However, it's, it is intentionally left extremely ambiguous, um, and so like like um, it's not a very hard problem. I've done it to um, uh, implement M with call CC. You know, so like, like, a really simple implementation is you make a you make require uh, some sort of macro or something. I don't think it has to be a macro, but um, you'll you if the expression evaluates to false, then uh, we'll call CC. We'll go back in time to and we'll just try another AMP. So the naive implementation is just going to try the Cartesian product of all your AMP values. Or at least until we either find one that succeeds or we run out and then we'll crash. All right. Um, so uh, it, now M can get really tricky really fast. Um, there is um, there's a lot of potential for diversion. So let's see. Here we go. So here we go. This 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 is an infinite amp. Can can, can, can everyone see that? Um, or, uh, can can everyone see that? This is all the natural numbers, right? It's an m of every possible number of zero and up. Make, does it make sense? Um, so um, you know we can. Uh, well, suffice to say, if you um, if you approach this naively, you're asking for divergence. You know, you're, you know, you're asking for um, essentially searches that may or may not terminate. You know, there's this like really like, fundamental problem with computer science, of course, is detecting. You know, or it's proven that you can't, in general, detect when a program is going to get into an infinite loop. You can't, you can't pre-detect divergence. So. Um, and one way to think of this is every AMP is sort of like a, a, a new branch on a search tree. So you know we're gonna, you know we're gonna like the first the first call to ink here or AMP ink or whatever is uh, is gonna you know split into two and then it's gonna split into two. Okay, but another way to think of it is that you've got uh, each each reference to NATs anywhere in the program. Is going to branch out into an infinity of possibilities. And if you have more than one of those, you know, if you have another M or another reference to NATS somewhere in the program, that's going to branch out, <laughs> and you're going to get this huge number of search possibilities really, really fast. So I just verified that um, people are still using Mini Camera here to learn on, which is great. And actually, as I under, as I think of it, I, I don't hear, I don't know why I don't hear this uh, uh, explicitly pointed out very much, but. Mini Canron is actually a super amp, and it's a very smart amp. So Mini Canron, I've, I haven't used it in uh, so long, I've forgotten the syntax, so I can't give a good example. But a way to think of it, of the way that it does a search, it uses what's called a fern, um, which is, it's, it's, it, you know, 
of course, as you know, it, it, it still diverges some of the time, but um, uh, what, what's going to happen is it doesn't do a depth first search down all these possibilities because that would be just hopeless. You know, if the first possibility you searched and failed, if the second possibility was a success, you'd never find it. So, what it does is it sort of searches to uh, different parts of the tree to varying levels of depth. So there's sort of this, there's the deep part of the search, and there's the shallow part of the search. So we're, sort of, we're looking at these parts a little more breadth first. We're looking at these parts a little more depth first. But we're not, we're never getting hung up on any of them. Of course, as you know, if, if you've used it, that you, you can get that thing will diverge all the time. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's good, but it's you know it's not perfect. It can't be perfect. Um, all right, I think that covers the first part. Now, let's look at the Fargo models. So, um, I want you to be completely disoriented at this point and thinking, what on earth do these two topics have to do with each other? There should be, there should be, there be no apparent connection until uh, after, you know, I don't know, another 10 minutes. So, let's get rid of all of this. And I'm just going to list, without going into a lot of uh, details or examples, uh, just because it takes too long, I'm going to list some. Um, Ways that thinking is different from formal logic. You know, you've all seen all the formal logic, you know, and it's all you know, precise and everything. So, thinking as a, as a human psychological process and formal logic, you know, as a branch of mathematics. And uh, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, modern formal logic uh, started with this fellow named Gottlob Frege in the late 19th century. Who his, his goal with it was to completely expunge everything psychological from logic. Because before that time, people, logic referred specifically to thinking. That was what it was, it was about. And after Frege, it's been no, no, that, none of that thinking, no, no, no psychological elements whatsoever. So they have, in fact, diverged in a different sense. So, uh, and these are in, you know, this is not going to be an exhaustive or even systematic list. So uh, real thinking is usefully biased, meaning we don't, uh, there are many, many possibilities we could think of, but we are very, we, we don't really look at very many of them because we usually come up with the right answer pretty fast. You know, like when I thought of how do I walk over here to Lindley Hall, I really didn't explore a lot of alternatives. It was like, I can go by down this path through Dunn's Wood or I can go around. You know? <laughs> um, I didn't think of like, Maybe I could just walk straight through the concrete, through the landscape. <laughs> this just never crossed my mind. <laughs> it was not even an alternative to explore. But there's another aspect of thinking, which is that uh, it is very flexible. Um, you, in other words, when I tell you this crazy idea, you can understand it. And and like, and if you look at a lot of thought, it is crazy, like schizophrenic sorts of ideas. There are a lot of a lot of scientific thought. In a previous, if you didn't know the reasons, basically the psychological pressures that led people to think of it, you would never, um, you would you consider someone crazy. So quantum mechanics is a classic example. There was a lot of, there were a lot of very specific experiments that led people to start looking in that direction to come up with this weird probability way, you know, kind of thing, which if you didn't have that, you never would have thought of it. But the human mind is able to think of it. So the, the flexible here is, I don't know if you, it, it needs underlines or something. It needs, it's, we're amazingly flexible. Another aspect of thought that's different than formal logic is that we have limited attention. So um, we miss a lot. Um, you know, another sort of like, have you ever have you ever had a um, uh, have you ever had a bug in a computer program you've been writing? Right. <laughs> so that's because you didn't think of something, right? <laughs> it was. It was. You know. It, your attention will get steered to it, you know, just as the scientist's attention got steered down the quantum mechanics route. So you will, you, sometimes you can find the stuff you're missing. But that ought to, uh, the fact that it's possible to have bugs in even very simple programs shows that we miss a lot, you know, and who knows what else we're missing? Probably almost everything. Um, if you think how big everything is, you, know, you have no choice. <laughs> so another, so um, another aspect of thought is priming. Uh, this is the way that if you are told and ex um, if you if you see one thing, your mind is sort of primed to see similar things that you would not you otherwise would not have noticed. 
and priming is found all over the place in, in not just human brains. There, uh, this is not going to be a psychologically meaningful example, but I think it's a neat example. Um, the, um, actually, I was about to say this with frogs, but it's not just frogs, it's human brains too. Um, if you're expecting a sound with a, of a certain pitch, or it's going to have a certain pitch component in it, the hairs in your ear that resonate with that sound, you know, they need a little bit of energy to, to, to fully resonate. Your brain gives preferential energy to those hairs, or to the neurons connected to those hairs. In other words, you become more sensitive to the things that you're primed for, and you're primed by whatever just happened. So this is like, this is a huge factor in how we actually think. It doesn't really uh, relate. <laughs> um, another thing is uh, we have competition between multiple ideas, and um, I, didn't, I, didn't think, I didn't look up an example of time, but you can see evidence for this in speech errors. You know, if you say something like, um, you know, like spoonerism, have you ever seen those? You, know, that you sort of have two things going on in your head at once, and they, they get merged, and it comes out ridiculous, or, or Freudian slips, another classic example. Um, so there's competition going on all the time. Um, we, um, under appropriate pressure, will explore to unlimited depth. I better wrap this up here. Um, so uh, anyway, so all of this, the comparable aspect of formal logic for all of these is it sees all, right? <laughs> all at once, right? All of formal logic, you have like all the possible theorems that you could ever prove, they're all, they all sort of exist already, right? They're all just there. There's no, there's nothing, um, there's nothing physiological, you know, there's nothing temporal, you know, et cetera. You know, so it's, formal logic is basically abstract, it just, I would say it just sits there, but where does it sit? Um, let's see. So a couple other, um, a couple other odd things. So another aspect of thought is that it's dominated by analogy, meaning um, we look at things as as if they were other things, and for, I mean, and it's really easy. You know, you've seen analogies like on the SAT tests and that sort of thing. They're all like very sophisticated, but analogy kind of dominates everything, like. Um, you, the first time I've seen a chair shaped like this, you've never seen a chair shaped like that before. What makes you think it's a chair? It's because it, it has. You're able to sort of um, sort of munge it a bit to say, oh, it's 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 like those other chairs. You know, you're able. You know, there's um, analogy is kind of how we are constantly able to adapt. as the other thing. So formal logic is very brittle. Um, we're very adaptive. Um, and and, and um, analogy is, has, this, at least in the far world, when you say the concepts are slippery. Um, whereas formal logic tends to be extremely rigid. You know what I mean? If, if anything is the slightest bit off, you know, never, <laughs> you know, or, or program crashes or something like that. Um, in fact, and the last thing I'll mention here, I made too big a list. Um, but we are tolerant of contradictions. Tolerant may not be the right word, but if we don't crash if we have a contradiction. And if, as you know if, from um, writing programs with bugs in them, you don't notice. You don't even notice the contradictions. Whereas in the formal logic, there's the principle of ex falso quadlibet, which means um, from a falsehood, you can deduce anything, anything you want. So, uh, and this, by the way, this never happens with people. Like, if you make a mistake, like if you drop a minus sign in, in, when you're doing an algebra problem, you don't think that out that like Australia is in the northern hemisphere, right? It just, it just never happens. <laughs> you know? So but whereas the formal logic, that happens. <laughs> you know? Instantly. You know? There's no time involved here. Okay. So um, so FARG models are an attempt to computationally model some of these things. Of course, as, as you should um, it has probably crossed your mind by now, modeling this computationally is pretty close to impossible. It's really, it's very, very hard. None of these things are easy to pin down. You, you try to make computational models, they become slow, they become intractable, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what FARG models are about. So I'll give you an example of a FARG model. Good thing this wasn't a 10 minute time. So the most famous FARG models, model is called Copycat. And Copycat tries to model analogy making. 
And it, uh, rather than try to model analogies in a, a complex uh, domain of normal field, Kattegat works with uh, strings of letters, A to Z, and the rules are the letters are no different. Uh, the, the only facts about the letters that you can take into account are that 24 of them have a predecessor and a successor. The A has a successor only, and the Z has a predecessor only. That's it. So like, what words that still have that include those letters, no, no, it doesn't matter. There's also no rap word. Right? That's it. It's just, they're just 26 uh, meaningless symbols, really. Um, but they have this predecessor-successor relationship. This is, this is about as simple a micro-domain as you can make that is still so rich that um, it's, you would never understand it, actually. And, um, and uh, but it's rich enough to allow some something a little bit like human analogy making to happen. So I'll show you a couple of examples. So here's what copycat does. You give it something like this. You say, if ABC changes to ABD, uh, try what happens if you do do the same thing to IJK. That's why it's called copycat. Right? But of course, what does it mean to do the same thing? So pro probably, as you, as you look at this, you're thinking, well, duh. You know, IJL. Another interesting difference uh, with uh, this aspect of thinking is we are not usually limited to just one problem. Right? We kind of see better or one solution. There are some kind of better and worse solutions. We have some kind of aesthetic judgment that's rather than that. So you can see another somewhat reasonable answer to this would be IJD. It's kind of dumb, right? But you can see how, okay, there's some reason to it, but it doesn't exploit the relationships in the original example. Uh, as well as IGL did. Um, so another, uh, I'm, I'm going to run through these awfully fast. I'm going to sort of deprive you of uh, whatever joy you may have in, in, in solving them. But if ABC goes to ABD, what does XYZ go to? This illustrates another aspect of human thought, which is that uh, we're tolerant of you know, things not being quite right. So there is no successor to Z. So you know what you're going to do. Um, uh, one, here's one thing you could do. Somewhat reasonable. You could say, oh, no, the next one is, <laughs> you know, the, since Z has no successor, we're just stuck, right? We can't go past Z. But, you know, if you think a while longer, and this is not an obvious solution, but most people tend to agree that this is what I'm about to tell you, it's actually a pretty good solution. Um, WYZ, and here, here's why. If you just kind of, if you sort of loosen your know, slip, your, your understanding of uh, this first example, you say, all right, we had a start. And next to next, you know, start a predecessor, or start a successor, successor, and we we um, sort of did two successions on the last one. All right. In this case, we, we don't have a start, but we have an end. Right. Start is kind of like end. You know, it's right? there's not many similarity there. And if we if we have if we're starting at end, we're working our way back. Right. So so what was what we thought of as successor up here, it's kind of slip to become predecessor in this one. And in that case. If we're going the other way, right, left, instead of going left to right, now we're going right to left, we're going, you know, end, you know, to uh, predecessors. In that case, we should double predecessor of the X. So it's, you know, this is, it's, it's, you know, um, it's not going to, it's not Skynet, okay, but it's, <laughs> it's not intended to be. It's, it's, we're, the, the only intent of part of really, is just to learn something about how human thought works a little more closely than voyage over home. And here's one more. Um, this one, you can stare at this a while. The M R R J J J. What does that go to? Uh, rather than yeah, I mean, rather than struggling with it, I'll just tell you one. It's not it's not at all obvious, but most people think it's a pretty good solution. It's, right. So we're, again, we're kind of we're looking at the we, each time we have a different example, a different. Um, Sort of case to try it on, we, re, we revise the way we understand it. All right, so now, how do FARG models work? Uh, they, there's this uh, thing uh, called the FARG architecture. <laughs> which uh, contains three main elements. Uh, there's, um, there's a workspace which is a graph of the current solution that we're looking at and whatever sort of little annotations and things we've got. So it's a, um, it's a great big messy graph. 
So, you know, we think about it right here. If A, B, C, blah, 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 and we um, said, hey, we, we could think of these as a group, right? We haven't yet thought about the C yet, let's say. And we could say, oh, look at this. We've noticed that the A to B is a successor, and we've noticed that that's a successor. Right? And, we've, and then let's say we've, um, maybe we've done some of the same things down here. We've said, uh, We said, oh, look, that, that's a successor right there. And, um, oh, look, you have a successor here and a successor there. Isn't that interesting? You, know? um, you have to have a very low bar for it. <laughs> but it's interesting when you're, when you're a partner. Um, <laughs> but the idea is, uh, oh, it, it's to, um, to model a lot of stuff that you, know, you don't really uh, introspectively think about. Um, but another, another difference between um, the real thinking and uh, formal logic in real thinking, almost every, almost all the action is sub-symbolic. You know, it's below the level of things you put into words. So the frog models are trying to do mo basically explore what's uh, be part of the iceberg that's below the water, right? And then, yeah. and if they, they they can do some of these things. Um, actually, a copycat can do all of those problems. I said, well, here's one that it can't do. Um, actually, I should, um, actually, I'll show you two that it can't do. So if ACE goes to ACF, you know, what does, uh, you know, let's say IJK go to? The, since they're two apart, it actually won't notice that. It just shows, it goes to show, it's a computer program. <laughs> it's, it, it, there are a lot of things that this is. And another kind of neat one here is, um, But A B C A B C D B G F H goes to A B C oops A B C D E G F uh, E F G H. Um, what does uh, what does R R L R R R R go to? And I, I think a pretty reasonable solution to this. Goes to R R R R R R R because if you think of the original here as we're fixing what's wrong with it, right? <laughs> so now what's wrong with it is completely different in both cases. But it's an interesting thing that you can tell a human being. Hey, you know, go, uh, you know, go, uh, like, open up the toilet and figure fix what's wrong with it. <laughs> you know, you you haven't looked inside. You don't know what it is. You know, you can go figure something out. <laughs> um, you don't have to be a plumber. Uh, all right, so I'm all <laughs> uh, we're running out uh, running out most of this time, but um, let's see. So workspace is one thing. We're just sort of hacking away, we're, we're messing with, you know, making little edits to this run. Uh, the thing that is doing all the edits it, are um, the things that are doing all the edits are um, codelets, which are little short bits of programming code that exist in a thing called the code rack, which is just all of the pending code rooms, the things that are you know, about to happen. And the idea is that it's, you know, it's supposed to be kind of parallel. You have a whole bunch of these codelets, they're all editing, they do their thing, they fire off another code that uh, they follow up. You have most codelets, um, they're all in these categories. They're scouts that are looking for something, like typical um, one is, uh, hey, let's go find an unhappy note. Notes have some notion. Notes, notes have some notion of happiness. Um, there are testers that say, look, at, they use some cheap test to decide if something is good or not. And there are uh, builders which are fired off by testers if it's successful, and builders um, build something. So actually, um, I kind of think of these as continuations, right? And along a little, you know, there's a sequence of edits that you want to make to the, to the workspace, and each one of these is a continuation of whatever came before. And these could even be, there could even be a, a whole team of, once you built something, now you want to post something to follow up on that. Like, oh, now we want to go, hey, we just built a successor node. Hey, let's, let's see if there's a successor adjacent, right? Something that people often do is, like, you see one, and you start looking for another. So, you know, so you have this chain of, uh, of so, amazingly, I don't have that much time, and I do want to hear some uh, questions, or do you want to hear some answers <laughs> to my question. Um, so, oh, and there's one other, uh, there's a third element of the architecture. 
which is a big old associative, um, uh, associative network uh, that works by spreading activation of essentially concepts that are no, each node represents a concept. And the slip net can change its topology as we, as we go along. Okay, I can show you. Here, here's the slip net uh, for copycat. Page 18. <laughs> what? These fancy user interfaces have gotten me. Here we go. So here's here's a slip net. Um, you know, it's, and these things are like you know, well, predecessor. It's it's close. It, it's close in the slip in the slip net to successor, so that by spreading activation, if one gets woken up, the other will get woken up. Um, has anyone has um, have you all seen spreading activation? I don't think it's a common computer science idea. Here's, here's how I think of spreading activation. It's late at night, you have an apartment building with thin walls. Someone gets up and they turn on the radio. Well, the noise comes through to the neighboring apartment. They wake up too. <laughs> all right. And you know, the noise just kind of spreads. The closer you are, you know, and it spreads throughout the whole thing. Maybe the first person falls asleep after a while, but this thing has, has sort of spread around. Spreading activation is computationally useful because you can activate any nodes in the network, and they and the sort of the wave fronts that come out from them will tend to converge on what is most relevant to all of them. So it's actually a very uh, very efficient way to search, and um, it's widely thought to be an important mechanism. But there's not completely limited. I don't think anyone can be all that search. Um, let's see. So. Um, so from, oh, um, yeah, here, uh, so a couple of, um, a few analogies that uh, inspired the far architecture. So one of them is um, sort of from flirting to marriage, right? So you, you, when you, um, you know, you, you see someone, you, your eyes meet across the coffee house, right? <laughs> and at, at that point, it's, you're, you're, you're judging a very superficial characteristic, appearance, you know, that's it. <laughs> that's all you know, you know, and, um, and as you get to know people more and more, you spend more time with them, so you have more depth in the explorations that you're doing, and fewer candidates. Another thing that works the same way is resumes when you're hiring, when you're hiring uh, looking for candidates for a job. You know, when the resumes come in, you, um, you, um, you might reject a resume for having a spelling error. Very superficial reason to reject the resume, but at, when you have 700 resumes, you aren't. You're just looking for any reason to reject them. And then you have phone conversations, and then you finally have the interview, and blah blah blah. And also, though, as you as you start exploring more depth, you have fewer fewer candidates. You know, the coffee house is still there. You know, you're still you're still meeting people. So a flirtation at the coffee house can easily wreck a marriage. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, in other words, the system is constantly able to readjust itself. Or to explore a completely new line of thought at any moment if something starts building up um, tension, attracting. Um, and actually, uh, a model that did or something that did not inspire Frog models yes. is oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> is um, Wikipedia. So has anyone here ever edited Wikipedia? Oh, you have. So have you ever had an edit reverted? Here, excellent. So, um, so I don't know if you're aware of this. But edits get reverted on Wikipedia all the time. So here's one I put in a couple of days ago. Um, just a typical example. Um, so I, this, is a, this is an article about uh, James K. Vardaman, who is a very famous uh, demagogue uh, governor of the American South in the early 20th century. And he's used as an example of demagogues in, you know, every, you know, in a lot of books on demagogues, especially American ones. So I just added a see also demagogue at the bottom, all right? And then three hours later, <laughs> I don't know why exactly, three hours later, someone removed it and they said POV, which on Wikipedia means it's a non-neutral point of view, like, you know, whatever. So um, what we could do is we could go to the top page. We could start exploring more reasons for and against this edit. You know, in other words, the line of thought could, in other words, the, the edit here could sort of trigger a development of a whole bunch more text. And actually, Wikipedia has a record of every single bit of this, so you can kind of see the process happening. I think Wikipedia is actually um, a really good example of this, essentially the same, same kind of approach, but where you have, you know, you have a, 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 a
that we're the um, somewhat analogous to COVID, so like a human head. And hopefully, Wikipedia is a lot smarter than all of Because um, that's really what firm models are trying to explain how you get intelligence out of stuff that's not intelligent. Um, so, I think I, I want to open this up to questions. Yep. So, uh, I, can tell you, I can tell you some more stuff here. But I've made a little language called Fardish uh, to address some lessons learned from FARB models, one of which is that they're, they're very uh, they're filled with hacks and they're, they're very hard and they're, they're, they're somewhat intractable and they behave in very erratic ways. I'm trying to make it so you can express what you want a little more explicitly. So now, now let's take this back to Anne. Um, so, um, so do you see how um, with mini camera, you know, you're exploring some things in a lot of depth, and some things very superficial. Hmm. <laughs> Anyone see an analogy here? Um, now, I don't think mini camera has any concept of kind of self-reflectiveness to go and evaluate which of these things are worth pursuing. Right? It just has a pretty generic algorithm. You just sort of, you know, the things that appear first in your front view or whatever. That's you know, let's got to look at those more, you know, and explore those into more depth. You know, before it gets to later. But I'm, I'm thinking, wait a minute, these far, I mean, um, this is a you know, far model to what I thought, but is there like an implementation of AM? So to answer your question, I don't know, but maybe, uh, you could, maybe you could say that um, AM, you know, a far model could, could be an implementation of AM. It's, it's, it's any way you want to implement it at all. It's just um, indeterminate. Um, okay, so um, I'm thinking, what, is, like, what do PL people have? Uh, like what ideas come to mind? I've, I've tried several times in my own code to sort of implement it with parts of it with AM, you know, sort of looking at the different different links you could put on one node. Hey, let's sort of sort of AM these out. I've never gotten it anything like that. Anyway, and what comes to mind? Does this sound like I mean, is this mini Cameron Cameron like? Is it you know is it AM like? Can you do anything with this? Were you here for, um, I've already forgotten the name, but someone who works at Microsoft Research gave a talk about the techniques they put into the I think it's flash fill or some feature of Excel where you can select a certain number of columns and then drag it and it will fill in the blank columns you expand on appropriately depending on the input that's already been selected. I, have, I wasn't here for that, but um, I, have been, I have heard about flash fill. Oh, yes, it has, it has an example-based approach, which is interesting, because another difference between human thinking and formalism is we, examples for us communicate abstract ideas much, much better than abstract approaches. Well, I was just wondering, like, if you had taken the time to think of, like, how copycat relates to what Flashbell is doing, which is, uh, seems to be primarily machine learning-based approach. Uh, I'm not sure how you characterize the approach taken with Clark models. Yeah, I'm not sure. So front models are very chaotic, uh, and they're CPU, they're CPU models. Um, so it's, in other words, they're not. There's, there's nothing statistical. There's nothing systematic. So it is a, it is a very, very different approach. Hence my you know, looking for ways to kind of stay true to the spirit of it. It's like, I'm doing that. Anyone else? Did this prime you to, to, to think of any other, any other, any other thoughts from PL? You know, has the spreading activation, it may take a while, spreading activation can take days. <laughs> 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 you know, as, as, the, as the wavefront moves and you trigger something. Like Maybe asking too much. To do. <laughs> what do you think? I once had an, uh, an economics teacher ask the class after he had explained um, basically how. Uh, Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. You ask the class, okay, now be a good economist and tell me something interesting about this in relation to supply and demand. <laughs> and amazingly, within one minute, one student got it, which is that curve is also the supply and demand. Well, <laughs> well it's, it is, we just passed by the clock, so. <laughs> We'll think about it over the weekend. <laughs> now I'm glad I took all the way to five. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thank you. <laughs>